When the U.S. Senate returns to business on January 22nd, Tom Udall will be the center of attention. While a familiar name here in New Mexico, certainly our senior senator is new to the Senate and wants to change the rules that govern filibusters. That vote will be big news. The senator sat down this week with NMIF producer Matt Grubbs to talk about his efforts, his new committee appointments, and what went wrong in addressing the fiscal cliff. Tom Udall is New Mexico's senior senator now. Hey, Matt, thank you very much. It's, a, it's a, a kind of bittersweet for me because sure. Senator Bingaman uh, served the state for 34 years as attorney general and then in the Senate. And he was a, such a good friend to me, a mentor, someone who I, I really looked up to. And it's kind of sad to see him go. But I'm, I've had four years in the Senate now, and I'm ready to step up to the plate and, and uh, carry out that role as senior senator. Excellent. Well, let's start with um, the most recent work, which is, of course, the, the fiscal cliff. Um, you, given your statements, um, that day are not terribly satisfied with what went down. What don't you like? Well, the, the first thing, Matt, and this is, this is something that I've been worried about for a long time. We're, we're in a unsustainable fiscal situation. Our budget uh, is really out of sorts. I mean, we're, we're looking at trillion dollar a year deficits. Our national debt is going up significantly as a result of that. And, and that whole situation, I think, if we aren't careful, could drag uh, down the economy. And really, uh, this budget deal didn't do much about the long term. It made a little bit of progress, but it didn't, it didn't really deal with, that, deal with that. And so that uh, was, was my disenchantment. It did some very good things, though. I mean, middle uh, income people are not going to have a dramatic tax increase. We would have been increasing their taxes to the tune of $2,200. Uh, doctors would have had uh, a 26 percent cut in their fees, uh, and we were able to resolve that. Uh, many people um, in, in higher incomes, but not, you know, the wealthy, not millionaires and billionaires, were running into something called the alternative minimum tax. Uh, and that has been moved so that middle income people don't hit uh, the alternative minimum tax. So there, there are good things there. We raised some revenue. We've, in the past, we've uh, uh, done some significant funding cuts. And, the, and probably one of the other disappointing things is we kick the can down the road on the sequester, on the debt ceiling, uh, and on the continuing resolution. And so in the next three months, sure. we're going to hit the wall on those three things. So in a sense, we got rid of one fiscal cliff and we're going to hit three more in a couple of months. And I don't think that's a good thing for the economy. Congress seems to be one giant game of kick the can <laughs> right now. And I, 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 do, do folks there realize how ridiculous this looks to the it's rest a, of the country? And, and, and I, I hear it when I'm back in New Mexico. I hear sure. from my constituents, and they are uh, uh, very adamant that, one, we should get along with each other a lot more than we do. We should cut out the bickering, cut out the blame game, uh, and try to work with each other and get things done that the American people really care about. And so that's, uh, that's the message I take when I go back there, and that's the way uh, I've behaved as a public servant. Um, there's been a note made since the vote of a lot of the extenders for, for corporate yes. income tax. Now, part of that deal um, is about $12 billion in subsidies for wind energy, and you are you're very much in favor of that. Um, just explain why you feel that that much money needs to be set aside to foster this industry. Sure. The, the, um, e e let's look broadly with energy, first of all. We, we know uh, that we need to diversify uh, our energy in a, in a significant way because we're, we're hurt in terms of uh, the international situation, who controls the oil that's left in the world. Um, we know that there are all these uh, things that are impacting us in terms of climate and burning fossil fuels. And so moving into the renewable area is very important. And it's great for New Mexico because New Mexico uh, has had dramatic growth in this area. And so what we need to do, we're, we don't want them to become permanent uh, subsidies to the wind industry or to other uh, renewable uh, energy areas. But, but 
What we want to do is foster enough of innovation and creativity and, and dedicated capital to this area that we get some breakthroughs and we bring the cost down. And we've done that pretty dramatically with wind. Um, and so really what folks are talking about is give them five or ten years. I, I don't think we should do this year by year. I would look at it and say give them five or ten years and then cut them loose. But at least give them the certainty. Tell people uh, that are venture capitalists, that are people that are interested in this area, you know, we want to see this develop significantly. Sure. You know, and we did this, Matt, the most interesting thing is looking at our industries that started as fledgling industries, nuclear, oil, gas. We, we gave them subsidies. They still have the subsidies and they're mature industries. What we're just arguing here is a, is a fledgling industry should have um, a little bit of this kind of backing uh, to, to help them break through and to bring the cost down and, and have us have a more diversified energy portfolio. I mean, I, I think uh, everybody agrees that you're better having clean energy uh, than, than the other energy forms, and so we need to be moving sure. in that direction. But you also just sort of illustrated the problem, which is that once Congress puts these in place, they're there forever. And that's money, as you just said, we don't have. Well, um, we, how do you square that? And we've had, say, we've had some very uh, close votes on, on big oil continuing to have subsidies. And, and I think it's just a matter of time before we take them away. Uh, the same thing's true in, in several of the other uh, more mature industries. But we have to have the guts and the courage to take on a big established industry after we've managed to allow them to grow. And, and that's just the reality of it. And, and uh, I'm willing to do that. I, I think my record has been like that on the votes. Uh, but uh, it's important that, that new uh, up-and-coming industries be given a little bit of support. On the payroll tax, my understanding, uh, Washington reporters love to do this, here's how the deal went down thing, you know, in the, in the days after it. Um, my understanding is that was never really on the table. Um, it wasn't on the table. For the it average was. New Mexican, that's about, or New Mexican family or household, it's about $900 a year now more that they're going to have to pay because that payroll tax holiday, it was termed, expired. Um, you mentioned that the Bush tax cuts, uh, at least for people at that level, have been extended. Um, but that sort of shrinks or almost cuts in half, that $2,200 you were talking yeah, about. Yeah. It's, that's hard for a lot of people to stomach when they see $12 billion going to wind energy. And I should be fair, it's not just wind energy. I mean, we've seen millions for cut out for Hollywood, for other biofuel research. Um, NASCAR <laughs> for motorsports entertainment. I mean, sure, all job creators, but that's tough for somebody who says, wait a second, so now every paycheck, that's going to add up to $900 no. more for me. Well, some of, now, Matt, there's a, I want to distinguish a couple of things here because we voted on this thing right near midnight. Sure. Uh, we weren't able to read it. And, and I'll tell you, uh, that was a very unfortunate thing that happened because when the staff and the media and everybody has, you know, 72 hours uh, to look at a piece of legislation, the kinds of things you're talking about uh, would come out publicly and we'd get them out of the bill. Uh, and so there was a list out there of things that, uh, that, that shouldn't have been in the bill, in my opinion. Uh, in fact, I, I was back home here and, and my wife was watching on television. I came into the room and she said, I wouldn't vote for any of those senators, including you, based on that package and that you named some of them there. Uh, and I, I, I think that it, we've got to legislate, and I think this has been my entire career in public service, legislate out and open, in, transparent, tell people why we're, do, why, we're do, why we're doing something. And the reality is, you know, somebody may have a good argument on NASCAR, but let them make it publicly. Let them win the rest of us over and let the American public see the process work and know and understand. Now the way that's done, and, and you just demonstrated it, you went through the list, they, we, we're, we're in this position of how did those get in there? Well, the reality is, I'm sad to tell you, that we were briefed by Vice President Biden, and within an hour of that briefing, they were still pulling the language, the actual language we were going to vote on, and, and uh, they uh, pulled it together, and at about 1.35, we were, we were called to the floor, 
Uh, and I called my staff shortly before that and I said, what, what have you been able to find out? And they said, just the talking points that have been put out. Uh, we haven't seen the actual language of the bill. And so we voted uh, and only learned uh, days later as to actually all of the things that were in there. Sure, and so sure. I think we would have taken many of those out if we had known. What about uh, that payroll tax? Because but that the was payroll people tax, knew about no, that. No, no, no. The sure. payroll tax is in a different category because you, you had a list there of, of some of the more controversial things. Let, let, me, um, let me talk about the payroll taxes. And, and everybody knows um, the payroll tax is for Social Security. That's, that's the system that's in place. That's how we fund it. And the decision was made, and I supported that decision a couple of years ago, that we're in bad uh, economic straits, that we need to get money uh, into the hands of the people that will spend it, uh, that are really being crushed by this whole economic recession. Sure. Uh, and the idea was, this was the simplest way of doing it, and I think it was smart. Rather than creating some new subsidy or new program or whatever, we just said, let's give a holiday on this particular payroll tax. Now, people should understand what we did is we replaced the revenue into Social Security. And so we had to take revenue from other places in the budget and move it into Social Security. And then that payroll tax uh, holiday went in and people had extra money. Okay. And as all economists say, if you they, they're, most of these folks are pinched. Uh, they're in a t tough situation. They're going to spend that money. It helps the economy. But now we've reached the point where we have job growth. We, we went a couple of years doing that. We have job growth. Um, we have uh, been able, with the job growth, bring down uh, unemployment. Uh, we've got a more solid economic footing. And so what we're really doing now is saying we're in a good enough position to give up uh, the payroll tax holiday, but we're going to make sure and protect uh, middle class tax cuts. Uh, and do some other things to try to encourage job growth. Sure. And so that's how we finally came out uh, on the payroll tax. It, it was a tough decision, you know. It could have, if we'd had a vote, uh, I'm not sure that, that some of us might have said, well, you know, maybe uh, another year, mm -hmm. maybe another year. But, it, but it, it, uh, it seemed to be that, as you said, and I think very accurately, it seemed to be the overwhelming opinion in both parties and the leaders and the president, sure. let's let this uh, payroll tax holiday expire. I want to talk about um, your, your next big task, which is filibuster reform. This is something that's been near and dear to you for a number of years now. And um, you're close to finding out just what's going to happen. For the people who aren't familiar, um, your changes to filibusters would require senators to come to the floor, um, and it would prevent them from filibustering um, motions that aren't essential, I guess, to the to the passage of the bill. Um, you're in this position now, where Majority Leader Reid could come back on the 22nd after the inauguration and say, "Okay, we just need 51 votes to change the rules." when any other time it's usually two-thirds. And there are some senators, some of your colleagues, Senator Levin and McCain, who aren't real fond of that. They say, look, the worm can turn at any time. If Democrats are in the minority, we're going to get slammed for doing this. Where are you with trying to get those votes? Um, it doesn't seem like you could get 67. Do you think you have 51? The, the, I think we do have 51. And I think the crux, Matt, is, is on the talking filibuster. Okay. Really, really what's happened uh, to the Senate is senators lodge these filibusters by telephone or walking into the cloakroom and talking uh, to the various leaders and saying, I don't want this to come forward. It's all a secret process. And so what we have uh, going on is a secret silent filibuster that's destroying the ability of the Senate to operate. Uh, most people are familiar with the filibuster. Mr. Smith goes to Washington. Right. You feel something with passion. You go to the floor and you speak about it. And, and uh, you know, you're either a hero to people or you're a bum, something along uh, that line. But it, it's out there. It's transparent. Now um, we have the secrecy. So what we're proposing is that we return uh, to the Mr. Smith goes to Washington type uh, filibuster. We get uh, uh, people to come down to the floor and object and, and deal with the debate of, of objecting and deal with the, uh, the uh, explaining to the American people why you're trying to hold things up. And I think we have 
very close, if not uh, a little bit over the 51 votes we need to do the talking filibuster. But you know, the ultimate vote counter uh, is uh, Harry Reid. Sure. Uh, senators go and tell him, uh, yeah, I may talk to the entire Senate, and, and, but senators go to Leader Reid and say, this is how I'm going to vote. And I may not be privy to that. Sure. And so he's so frustrated. I mean, he, he actually uh, uh, came to the floor and said the reformers like Tom Udall that were willing to change the rules two years ago, he says, they were right, I was wrong. I entered in, into an, a gentleman's agreement and it didn't work. Right, so, right. So I think what we're, uh, we're, we're trying to do is make the Senate work better. You know, people in New Mexico, Matt, may ask, well, why, what does this have to do with New Mexico? Well, the reality is, is we have this huge federal presence in New Mexico. We have these top-notch national laboratories, just first-rate uh, Air Force bases, public lands, national parks, national monuments. People come here for, for all of these things. And, and the reality is um, that, that we need to, to uh, uh, be able to get things done on the federal level through the appropriations process, through the authorizations process, things that make people's lives better in New Mexico. You know, we haven't had a regular funding process uh, for the, the national labs and, and uh, uh, many of our other institutions for a long time. Sure, yeah, Cri we're years. crippled by uh, continuing resolutions, big omnibus bills, rather than dealing with this in a, in a systematic, open, transparent way. And so that's really what I'm fighting for is more and, and uh, more and better openness and then also the opportunity for New Mexicans to at least get a vote on the things they care about, whether it's education, health care, jobs, economic development, job creation, sure. all of those kinds of things. And not just have them held up. Um, I want to get to your, um, your committee assignments, but real quickly, you are in favor of, of that 51 votes of, of using oh, that. Oh yeah, well I was, the, I was the one. I picked up um, where Clinton Anderson did, okay. 25 year senator for New Mexico. I read his autobiography uh, just before I got into the Senate, reread it. My dad <laughs> recommended I do that. And I, he would go down every Congress and say, this would be a better place if we looked at our rules every two years. Okay. He had researched it and the issue is constitutional. And three vice presidents have ruled as precedent uh, for the Senate in, in opinions. They've said at the beginning of a Congress, with a majority vote, you can determine the rules. Doesn't mean we necessarily want a majority vote. We can, we, I'm seeking bipartisan. Sure. I'm seeking bipartisanship. But at the beginning of a, of a Congress, uh, um, a majority vote to cut off debate and then to go to adopt the rules. And there are a lot of things going on. We may well get uh, 60 votes for a standing order, which also changes the rules, or we may get even more than 67 to change the standing rules of the Senate, but we'll see what happens. I, I'm just for making the place work better for New Mexicans and the things they care about. Sure. Well, your committee assignments, um, appropriations, your first term senator, uh, that's a pretty big deal. <laughs> we don't have to give all our water to Nevada in 20 years or anything, do we? For you no, <laughs> no. I, I, uh, I, as you probably know, I know you've, you've been a reporter that's really stayed on top of things. I served on the Appropriations Committee in the House. Mm -hmm. uh, when, I, when the Democrats came in in 2006, I served for two years, and I found that it was a place... I could really help New Mexicans. And so when I decided to run for the Senate, I went and talked to Leader Reed. And I said, one of my conditions is going to be that you'll work really hard uh, to get me on the committee. And he said, hey, he says, I think we can do that and I think we can do it pretty quickly. I can't tell you exactly the timetable, but here I'm four years in and I'm on the Appropriations Committee. And, and why is that important for New Mexico? Because uh, this huge federal presence, these right. national laboratories, these three Air Force bases, White Sands Testing Range, uh, all the public lands and national monuments. Uh, we need to be sensitive in dealing with, with research laboratories and military installations when we look at the budget. I talked earlier about uh, the budget issues we're in. We've got to be smart. We've got to do this in a way that doesn't drive us into recession. And yet at the same time, we need to protect assets 
uh, like the national laboratories. It, it, should we be doing more basic research there? Of course. Um, should, we, should we innovate in our military to try to be the most efficient? Of course. Uh, but let's do this wisely. And so it puts me in a position uh, to be, as, as everybody says about appropriation, it's the guardian of the purse. Sure. You know, you're actually trying to spend the money well and spend it effectively. And so I, I hope that, that New Mexico will get a fair shake uh, with our federal presence uh, as it comes before the Appropriations Committee. And I'm going to work very hard for that. Well, Senator, we always appreciate your time, and we never get enough of it, but thanks for coming in. Thank you. Real pleasure.